Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. Uh, this evening, Father John Weifer is joining us. Father John, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Good to be on. Well, it, it's always a real pleasure. I'm honored to have you on in order to cover all these topics. And I always pose to you, what do you think it's something that people really need to hear? And you, I think this time I pose this one because we've obliquely talked about the veneration of saints when we talked about uh, iconography, for example, but never strictly the issue of venerating the saints. And it's an important issue because it's, I would say, the key issue that really separates us from all Protestants. Um, there's high church, Lutheran, Methodist, Anglicans that pray for the dead. Um, there's churches of liturgical calendars of liturgies and things like this. But what sets the Orthodox apart in other apostolic churches from the Protestants is the do not venerate the saints. And so this is an extremely important issue. And I'm surprised we haven't covered it sooner. And so you have a degree um, from a Protestant seminary. You've been steeped in this for years. So maybe as a way to get the ball rolling, would you be able to give a review of standard Protestant objections to our practice and maybe precisely what our practice is? Well, one objection that you'll hear from a lot of Protestants is just to the concept of saints being a category distinct from the average Christian, because they'll say, well, everybody's a saint. That's what you find in the New Testament. But, you know, St. Paul uh, used the phrase in his epistles, you know, to the church of, uh, you know, Ephesus called to be saints. Um, it's, sometimes even today you'll have someone might be addressing a monastery and they'll talk about, you know, the Holy Fathers of this monastery or something like that. And the word saint just means holy. So if you talk about the Holy Fathers of a monastery, you could also uh, have translated that as the saintly fathers. Um, but um, the the idea of calling yourself a saint is something that you don't find in, in uh, among the saints. Um, the, the, um, the best example of this is if you read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch, he wasn't even ready to call himself a Christian. Um, he said that, I hope that I may be found to be a Christian because he was on his way to Rome to be martyred. And uh, he considered the very name of being a Christian to be such an exalted thing that he wouldn't just assume that he was worthy of the name until he had proven it in his martyrdom. And so I, you could be pretty sure that St. Ignatius wouldn't say, oh, but I'm St. Ignatius, you know, I'm a saint, just like all the saints in heaven. I don't think he would have said that. Um, the other issue that they have is they'll often raise the issue of necromancy, because in the Old Testament, there's a for prohibition against, uh, uh, con you know, uh, consulting the dead uh, in via necromancy. And they'll say, well, that's what you're doing when you're praying to the saints. And the problem is with, with that is that necromancy is really using the occult as a means of getting information from the, from the departed. Whereas with the, when we address the saints, we are asking for their prayers. And, uh, and, but, they'll say, but they also, because Protestants have such a low understanding of what worship is, they confuse prayer with worship. They think that to pray is to worship not that worship is something distinct from prayer. And uh, what they need to understand is the very word prayer in English simply means to ask. It doesn't mean uh, worship. Uh, I, I pray you. Could you repeat that? <laughs> well, I, I worked for the, for the child support division for the state of Texas for uh, the last decade and a half of my tenure with the state. And, uh, one of the things that every petition you file in, in a court in Texas, and I'm sure that Texas is not the only state because it's probably something that goes way back in terms of English common law, is you end every a petition with a, a section that's entitled prayer, the prayer. So so the last thing in your petition, it'll say the prayer, and it says we pray the court that we will be granted all the relief that we have requested, blah, 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 blah. So it's just a standard 
way of saying, look, we, we, we told you what we want and we're asking you to give it to us. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, worship that's due only to God. This is just m simply making a request. And uh, so we don't worship the saints. Uh, we, we do honor them. And there is very clear uh, evidence that this is how the church has always understood it. And uh, what we do, we, we believe, as, Saint, as Christ said in the Gospels, when the Sadducees tried to present him with the, uh, the conundrum of a, of a woman who's married to seven brothers, so in the, in the kingdom of heaven and the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Christ said, you err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. God is not the God of the dead but of the living. So, so we believe that the saints are still alive and we believe that they're just as much a part of the church as we are. In fact, they're more a part of the church than we are because they're fully a, a part of the church. And, and whereas we are striving to be such. And what, there's a very interesting passage in the epistle to the Hebrews towards the end where St. Paul contrasts the old covenant with a new covenant. And uh, he uses Mount uh, Sinai and compares it with Mount Zion. He, he says, you've come to the heavenly Zion. And among other things he mentions, he mentions to the spirits of just men made perfect. Uh, so, so that's an aspect of the New Testament is that we have this relationship with the spirit of just men made perfect. And we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who cheer us on and we commune with them. When we take communion, we're not just communing with God. Most Protestants, when they think of communion, even some Orthodox, unfortunately, they think of communion as I'm going to commune with God. But we are communing with God, of course, but we're also communing with each other, which is why we talk about being in communion with people as opposed to not being in communion with people. But we are also communing with the saints in heaven when we partake of the Eucharist. So, we're joining in the heavenly worship with the saints every time we celebrate the liturgy. And so this is just a basic aspect of, uh, of Orthodox piety. Now, in the, in the passage you quoted from Hebrews is Hebrews 12, 23. Uh, it says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church, to the firstborn registered heaven, to the God of the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So it, we're not, it's interesting that that verse would never jump out to you, you know, in a context in which you're not used to venerating saints, but this is something where if you venerate angels and saints, that would make sense just because they're put there next to, next to God. But let me give you a common objection, which makes some sort of sense, which would be, how could the saints hear our prayers? Are they, how could they hear everyone's prayers on earth? Or aren't they too busy doing fun stuff in heaven? I mean, how do we answer that biblically? Well, this is an objection. And they, they say, well, look, you know, there are millions of people constantly asking for the Virgin Mary's prayer. And it's impossible to hear them all at the same time. So therefore, it's a ridiculous proposition. But uh, St. Paul tells us that what awaits us in, in heaven is something that we can't imagine. He says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of the man things that God has for them that, that love him. And he also, in, in the scriptures, it talks repeatedly about how our destiny is to reign with Christ and to be like the angels. And uh, so... It's impossible for a human being to have millions of people asking for your prayers at a given time and for you to be able to respond to that uh, in this life. It's not impossible for people who are in a glorified state and are like the angels. And uh, if, you, if you use the Internet as an analogy, the Internet's not omniscient. The, the Internet has a limit, a limit to it how much it can handle. We don't know what that is and it expands all the time, but there actually is a limit. Uh, we just don't know what it is exactly. Uh, but millions of messages are being processed. Billions of messages, in fact, are being processed all the time uh, through the internet. And um, so if we can imagine that, it, it, we, we ought to be able to, we, we should understand that if, if what awaits the saints is beyond our imagination, 
uh, then they're going to have abilities that are beyond what we can imagine and the internet we can imagine. <laughs> and, and, there's, and there's several things we have to be aware of other than the fact that the afterlife is not within the space time continuum. So the constraints right. of time scientifically, right? If we believe Einstein are going to be different, but the science aside, biblically speaking, this is where understanding the incarnation and orthodox doctrine is so important. Could a man hear the prayers of an earth? Well, yes, the God man can, Jesus Christ, and the saints are being made by God by grace, by theosis. And so it's not that they're so great, humanly speaking, that they could hear prayers and answer prayers. It's because by grace, they are experiencing the grace of God and are able to actually live as God according to his energies, not according to his essence, obviously. The Orthodox have this distinction, so we could say this very easily and not think too hard about it, while in the Western paradigm, which is what Protestantism comes out of, this would be very confusing. We would have to do a whole video on the energy essence distinction to really go, now prove that to the audience. But the audience should be just aware, because that exists, there's no real biblical objection to a saint having the capacity to act as God in that sense, because they have the grace of God to be, in a, to be able to do so. But now that we spent the time saying, all right, it's possible and your objections are silly, unless you're aware of more silly objections you feel like getting off your chest, my question may be, how do we make the positive case that the scriptures would... Um, would be teaching us that we ought to be venerating the saints. Well, we see in the in the New Testament, even among the still living in the flesh apostles, that uh, people would take even uh, handkerchiefs that had, had that the apostles had touched, and they would be healed by the handkerchief. People would be laying, laying down in the streets so the shadow of St. Peter would pass over them and they would be healed. And so even among people still in the flesh, uh, there was a, an, an understanding that these people had been changed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the Old Testament, even, we have the story of the prophet Elisha who was buried in a cave and then because some, I think, Midianite raiders were coming along and there was a funeral procession, they just chunked this uh, body of a dead man into the cave, and it happened to be the cave of the prophet Elisha because they were trying to uh, head for the hills. And uh, as soon as the body touched the bones of the prophet Elisha, the body was raised from the dead. So the idea that the, the saints, even their body, their bones, the things that they touch become... Uh, vessels of grace means by which people are healed and even raised from the dead is something that's clearly biblical and throughout the scriptures you find examples of references to the departed praying for the living you find that in the deuterocanonical book second maccabees being one example but you certainly find it in the book of revelation repeatedly uh, and uh Again, because we don't believe that the saints are departed, it's not, I mean, that they're really dead, that we believe they're still alive and they're still part of the church. It's not any more of a stretch for us to ask for the saints to pray for us than it is for us to ask anybody else that we know in the church to pray for us. Uh, matter of fact, you know, there was, this was one of the issues that I had when I was struggling with, with orthodoxy uh, as, a, as a Protestant who was interested. And uh, I'll never forget the way that it was resolved for me. I was having a conversation with a neighbor, uh, and he was telling me about the wife of a retired professor from Southern Nazarene University, where I went to school. And he said, "You know, that woman is a is a woman of prayer. If you if you got prayers that need to be answered, you need to go to her and ask for her to pray for you because that woman's got a hotline to God." And, and, and I remember when I'm talking like that and, and, and not having a problem with what he had to say. And then it occurred to me, you know, if any woman ever had a hotline to God, it would have to be the Virgin Mary, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so that's when I started to realize, well, hey, I'm going to talk to the woman with a hotline to God, uh, you know, that, that even a better one. 
uh, and uh, and Protestants certainly don't have a problem asking each other to pray for them, and they actually don't even have a problem venerating the saints because uh, you you hear Protestants uh, talk about great Christians that have gone before them and admiring them, uh, holding them up as examples to be emulated. Uh, I went to a church in Bethany, Oklahoma, that was called Williams Memorial uh, Nazarene Church, and it was named after R.T. Williams, who was a general superintendent, which would be kind of like an archbishop of the Nazarene Church. And he had he was a man that people greatly admired, and somebody obviously with some money uh, decided to. Uh, uh, donate it to that church and ask that it be done in memory of uh, R.T. Williams. Um, so, matter of fact, I'll tell you, the, the first time I heard the story of the life of the 40 martyrs, I was a Protestant. I was watching TBN, Trinity, Trinity Broadcasting Network, and John Jacob, John Jacobs and the Power Team were on, and, and, uh, and he was telling the story of the 40 martyrs. And I, I thought, you know, that was a very impressive story. And one of the first icons I got when I became Orthodox was an icon of the 40 martyrs because I thought that was so cool. But they, they hold up Christians from the past as examples. It's just the idea of asking for their prayers they get hung up on. But the question that they ought to be asking is, is, is if uh, no Christians prior to the Protestant Reformation ever had a problem with this practice. And as a matter of fact, even Jews will call upon people that, th that they consider to be saints, righteous people of the Old Testament, uh, and they ask for their prayers, why Why do you have a problem? You know, where do you think that this came from? Well, and yeah, let us let me go over a few biblical things that have been kicking around in my head, and we could definitely start unpacking the Jewish evidence. And uh, you made the point earlier how God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, right? And so... What do living saints do? Well, we know that Elijah, when Gehazi went to Naaman to try to defraud him out of money, and Elijah confronts uh, Gehazi about this, Elijah says, where are you? And Naaman says, oh, I wasn't anywhere. And um, Elijah responds, it's in 2 Kings 5, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? As in saying, I saw exactly, I knew exactly what happened. So if right. the living saint could do this and he's still living according to the scripture, well, clearly they don't lose their ability to have clairvoyance, to, to right. know what you're thinking, to know what you're praying. Um, so really the, the Protestant objections that this wouldn't be possible and this is something saints don't even do would actually be incorrect biblically speaking. They can maybe make the argument, well, some saints do, but the rest can't. But what would they base that upon? It's It's a... It's assumption contrary to the only scriptural evidence we have that actually weighs in on the issue. Uh, but we also have interesting indications of very profound veneration throughout the scriptures. And we'll read these passages without thinking too hard about them. Like Christ speaks to the Pharisees that don't you adorn the monuments of the righteous? Well, obviously, they're venerating the righteous if they're adorning their monuments and, and they're painting over their tombs. We have throughout the Old Testament, uh, this is an interesting practice. The putting up of rock piles everywhere, something cool happens. And it wouldn't be the first thing I think about with veneration, but it's obvious memorials. And they give these very specific geographic locators so people could find these things. Obviously, they're spots of pilgrimage. Do the venerate the saints or God where these events taken took place, and uh, so I feel that the burden of proof would be on those who oppose the veneration of the saints because all we have are actual examples of veneration and the and prayer of saints praying of saints knowing what people are doing. We don't have any evidence to the contrary if we're just going to go with the simple possibilist interpretation of the scriptures. But let me ask you this, because this is more of an obscure episode, and it gets back to Elijah. When um, Christ was crucified and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in the Hebrew or Aramaic, I'm not a language expert, it sounds similar to the name of Elijah. And people confuse it as such, thinking that he's calling Elijah to intercede for him. 
Could you give us some detail as to the significance of that event and how that may give us a window into Jewish practice? Well, I would say at the very least, they didn't say, how dare he call upon the prophet Elijah? Doesn't he know that that's a uh, worship due only to God to call upon, uh, you know, someone in prayer? Uh, obviously, they misunderstood what he was saying, but they didn't find an objection to the fact that he was calling on Elijah. And some another example is in the Psalms, you find this in our and we pray the Psalms in the church. The Psalms are the biggest book of the Bible and they're their prayers that we sing and we we pray. There are prayers in the Psalms that address angels, and uh, and our destiny is to be like the angels. So why would we assume that we can call on angels in prayer, but we can't call on uh, the saints? And that's uh, the thing I reflected upon was the significance that Elijah was bodily assumed. Right. And so Elijah being bodily assumed would be the same Elijah that knew where um, Gehazi was going at the very least. And so it shows that this was widely recognized within Judaism, that that connection I made wasn't some sort of crass eisegesis. You literally see the application in three of the Gospels that report the event. Right. Uh, But there's also, like we were talking about off air, the Gospel of Matthew reports the event that when Christ was crucified, the we presume, because we know from 1 Peter chapter 3, he harrowed, there's the harrowing of Hades. But at that time, the bodies of the saints were bodily resurrected, and many saw them in Jerusalem. And so this speaks to the fact that as we well know as Orthodox from the icon of Christ grabbing Adam and Eve and pulling them out of the tomb, that not every saint would have been like Elijah, where maybe you could beckon and call them and they would have been available at that time, that there was something qualitatively different for a lot of these saints after the resurrection. And uh, I don't know much more details on this particular topic is to be perfectly frank when I read the fathers and more of my reading on this topics on the earlier fathers in the first five centuries, there's not too much speculation on it, but at least I could say looking at the scriptures, it explains why the asking of certain saints for intercession may not be common because the scriptures tend to be recorded before this might've become a normal practice, something that you could expect. I think A lot of people don't understand that in the Orthodox Church, a big way which we perceive who the saints are is that they answer prayers after they die. Right. Some some in some in rare cases answer prayers while they're still alive. You know, like Saint John Maximovich, for example. But people will venerate a saint because now there's miracles attributed to their intercession. And so being that that's an organic way in which the Orthodox recognized saints today, clearly, even if that weren't the case back then, it's certainly possible. It's a workable system. If it exists now, it could certainly exist then. So I wonder if you have any comments on that issue, and then maybe we can move to the issue of the veneration of saints within Judaism. Well, it's interesting when you look at uh, the Old Testament temple, that the Old Testament temple, when you add up all the references to the images of cherubim, you discover that the temple was covered with cherubim from floor to ceiling on the doors and on the curtains. And so you might ask, well, why were there no images of saints? Well, the saints of the Old Testament were not in heaven, and, and the temple was an image of heaven. It was based on what heaven was. I mean, it was a, it was a it was a, based on the prototype of of the heavenly worship. And uh, in an Orthodox church today, you'll see that it's covered not just with images of angels, but also with the saints, because that's the that's heaven post resurrection of Christ. Uh, but um, in the uh, in, in the earliest martyrdom recorded outside of Scripture, the martyrdom of Polycarp, we have some very interesting references to the veneration of the saints. Uh, because after Mar- Polycarp was martyred, 
the Jews, which encouraged the Romans to martyr him, uh, appealed to the governor and said, well, look, you know, don't let them have his body because if you give them his body, then they'll worship him like they did Christ. And uh, so they cremated his body and the Christians gathered up what was re remained of, of his bone fragments and ashes and uh, and they talk about how they treated it as the greatest treasure and they said not that not that we would worship them like these people accuse us of wanting to do but that we honor the saints we adore christ but we honor the saints and they also said that uh that they would keep his uh his his relics so that they could have the annual memorial of his martyrdom and uh, and so the, the memorial that was done once a year in, in honor of St. Polycarp, they say, was to, to remember his, what he did and, and to basically admire and, 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 uh, and remember what he did. But also it was for the training of those who would yet face martyrdom. And so it's for our, our, ad, our, our edification and our instruction and that's why we have services in honor of saints so that we can learn to be like them because you, you might think, well, yeah, I'm never going to be in an arena where I'm going to be facing martyrdom like St. Polycarp, but that's probably what a lot of Russians in 1916 thought. And then within uh, a, few, a couple of years, they were being murdered in some of the most grotesque ways in, in recorded history. But a pious Russian Orthodox Christian who'd been hearing the, the lives of the saints and listening to their services and praying uh, along and, and asking for these saints uh, for their prayers, they would know what a martyr is supposed to do under such circumstances. They had been trained, even though they might not have realized that, that that's what it was, but they were prepared. So that's why we do it. And, and uh, like I said, this is the earliest martyrdom recorded outside of the church. I mean, outside the, the New Testament. And St. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. So if you want to say that the church was already uh, corrupt and pagan by this point, you have to assume that the Apostle John was not a very good teacher because he couldn't even pass the faith on for one generation. And that's, that's something I want to unpack in some more detail. And you know what? Maybe we'll fast forward and talk about that, which would be by the time we get to the fourth century, the early church evidence of, and now I fast forward centuries, hundreds of years, longer than America has been around. But once you get to the fourth century, it becomes incontestable that the saints are being venerated. We have several prayers. We have archaeological evidence with graffiti of prayers to, uh, to saints, particularly Mary. Uh, we have, in one of the earliest liturgical documents, the anaphora of St. Basil, it's actually an Egyptian liturgy, and it was before St. Basil, mentions prayers to Mary and to the saints. You get, and actually, and also in the Council of Constantinople I, and it, the letter that calls the council also makes mention to prayers to the saints. And so you have these mainstream documents, which is why I speak of the synodical document, where this is just taken for granted, everyone does that. Well, why is that relevant, you may say? This is centuries after the beginning of the church. All this sort of bad stuff could have happened. Well, here is the issue. If you speculate there are this mass apostasy by the time of Polycarp and Ignatius and maybe Irenaeus, that the second century does everything just fell apart, the problem is, well, then what do we base our Christianity upon? The Protestants will say the scriptures. But your canon of the scriptures, and whether you admit it or not, your whole paradigm of understanding it, if you're not an overtly heretical Protestant, Trinitarianism, and things to that effect, all come from the fourth century. And so if the people that gave you your canon and gave you really the lens in which you read those canonical scriptures were venerating the saints, if they were in such egregious error, they're practical crypto polytheists for venerating the saints then on what basis do we have even Christianity, which any historian would tell you without the fourth century would be incomprehensible in a, in a documentary sense, documentary sense. Right. And so I think the point you make, yes, it may it's just Polycarp. They've had it so bad. They've heard from the apostle John and then changed things so much. 
But then just, I think if we thought critically about how do we even know what Christianity is that in a documentary sense, right? Other than Christ revealed in your heart, right. speaking documents, how could we even have that without having venerating the saints? I don't think anyone ever asked that question. If they did, I don't think they could reject it. Right. You'd have to you'd have to say that Job's witnesses have a pretty good case to make if you if you're going to toss out uh, everything, even starting with the uh, early second century, uh, uh, and basically just say I'm going to go by the New Testament only. Uh, you could, there's there's ways to interpret the scriptures the way the Jehovah's Witnesses do, obviously, or or else they wouldn't have done it. The Arians wouldn't have done it that way. Uh, but uh, but if you're if you're going to make any historical arguments, which when I've heard Protestants make arguments against Jehovah's Witnesses, they invariably do make appeals to historic Christian understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, so and so if you're if you're not going to make that, then you really don't have much of a, a leg to stand on. It's also a, a lot less annoying to do that. When my wife became Orthodox, we. We lived in Patterson, New York, which was where uh, the Jehovah's Witness Bethel, their missionary training center is. And so we were very used to evangelizing Jehovah's Witnesses. And long story short, when she was coming into the church, she realized there's we have saints and we have these doctrines settled. We have, a, we have an authoritative tradition. She was like, this is so much easier than having to argue with them about every – let you get into the Greek with them. I've got my Greek Jehovah's Witness interlinear over there. So – that that's absolutely right, um, but I think also a lot of these Protestant ideas came into vogue when the what's the term the verdict of history wasn't fully in, and here's what I mean by that. So when, for example, John Calvin was making his speculations, and he read fathers like Augustine and Ambrose and whatnot, but when he was making his speculations, the in style belief among uh, the erudite at the time was that the letters of Ignatius were fraudulent. So there have been Roman Catholics that took the view as well. They, they saw them as later forgeries. And so that seemed like a pretty respectable opinion at that time. Now, centuries later, we've got Syriac recension of them. There's people that are, are careful at looking the sources enough. We'll see that Ignatius letters are even quoted within Irenaeus, which is from the second century. It'd be a silly argument. No one could seriously argue that, that what we commonly accept as Ignatius letters, not the longer ones and the weird ones are not authentic. Now, another early source, and I hope to do a show on this in the future, you'd be welcome to join me by the way, would be first Clement. It's a source we take so much for granted, but it was only rediscovered, not among the Orthodox. They had it the whole time, but by the West in the 19th century. And so you had apostolic succession and all these doctrines, which were objectionable Protestants, in a document which is from the first century by anyone's measure, perhaps earlier than some scriptural books. Why is this relevant to the topic at hand? So let me look at the chapter right here. Well, in chapter six, in chapter five, St. Clement gives, he, he memorializes, he gives like, you know, he says nice things about St. Peter, St. Paul, because they died in Rome. But then in the next chapter, he memorializes saints that we, whose names we don't even think about, uh, Donidus and Dirce, however you say it. And the point is, we here we have a document from someone who's mentioned in Philippians chapter four. Right, So he knew the apostles. There's zero doubt about it. This is written at the same decades the apostles are writing things. And we can just see in passing, they're already at least holding in high regard their own martyrs. This, this is not some sort of late development. Our earliest documents bear this out. And so I think that's why it's worth saying the verdict of history has come so strongly in the Orthodox side. It would really seem if the same, the same access to these sources was available centuries ago. The Protest, the Protestant heresy probably would have taken a very different shape. Doesn't mean it would have not occurred, but maybe would have more popularly incorporated, let's say, some some of these more Orthodox Catholic practices. 
So right. you find references to the veneration of the saints throughout some of the fathers that the Protestants love to quote, like Saint Saint Augustine, Saint John Chrysostom. Saint John Chrysostom. One of the things that people don't necessarily realize when they look at the uh, Nicene Post Nicene Father series is that. When they're looking at the writings of Saint Augustine or Saint John Chrysostom or any other saints, they're generally looking at selections of their writings rather than their complete writings. And uh, Saint Vladimir's Seminary Press years ago published a collection of uh, Saint John Chrysostom's homilies on the on the, the the feast of various saints that were yeah. commemorated in Antioch. This is a big part of the liturgical life of the church in Antioch, they had martyrs all over the city. And when, when their feast day would come, they would go to the martyria of that saint and uh, they would celebrate the liturgy. And so he would preach sermons on these occasions, but these sermons are not included in that Presbyterian uh, Episcopalian collection because they didn't see the need for it. Um, but uh, another thing you can also look at is if you read Eusebius, his history of the church, you find him talking about how churches and martyrias were being built after the persecutions ended because they were free to do it. Some of these were being built even before then because these persecutions weren't constant. They would come and go. But another place that I, one of the first books I read when I became Orthodox was uh, Venerable, the Venerable Bede's History of the Church and People of England. And he talks about the exact same phenomenon happening in England when the persecutions ended because England was part of the British empire. And uh, so martyrias began to be built there too. Yeah, no, there could be no doubt about that. I forget what her name is. There's a fourth century source and she's like a pilgrim. She lived during drugs. Igaira she... diary you're, you're referring to. Who? I'm sorry. I Igaira, I think is how her name is pronounced. I think so. But yeah. the, right, but the point is, she describes in detail these these liturgical commemoration of the saints. There is right. zero doubt about this. The question would be more so: to what excess did they occur? Right, like we know by Saint Epiphanius. So, right, the question is not whether it was occurring. Right, it's when. Uh, what's his name? I don't get the wrong one. There's Helvidius, and there's the other guy, the the ones that Jerome's always arguing with. But. Uh, I can't remember at the moment. The point is, when they confront anyone, even mention anything against it, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, they just never heard of this before. And, uh, and well, another so, thing that's worth looking at is, you know, Protestants like to point to the iconoclast as if they're people that they want to claim as their forebears, even though better Protestant historians will acknowledge that they were the most uh, un unrighteous people. You know, they were, they, they were, they were not good Christians by even Protestant standards. But if you look at the false council that they held where they condemned icons, they also anathematized anyone who didn't venerate the saints and the Virgin Mary or the cross. <laughs> so the, the idea of veneration of the saints was never something that was even controversial. No, because it, it was, it was the universal practice at the time. And again, it's strange to me that the tables turned on the default position. This is something everyone's done for centuries. It's the only documented evidence you do have is that it's occurring. The only archaeological evidence you do have is that it's occurring. So how is the burden of proof on the side of the, of the status quo? This is what we've always done saying, well, you don't have enough documentary evidence. Right. So let me just ask this. Someone will say we've got dozens of letters from St. Cyprian. We got, Tons of work from Tertullian. We're talking about early, early fathers. We have books from St. Irenaeus that are getting quite a bit of detail. If venerating the saints was so important, why don't we have more documentary evidence? Uh, logical problems with that objection aside, why may that be the case that we don't have more extant evidence? Well, the thing is, after the persecutions ended, there's so much evidence that I don't see how anyone who's really familiar with the body of material that we're talking about could even make that statement. But you might have someone who'd say, well, why don't we have more evidence prior to the time of uh, Constantine of the veneration of saints? Well, we do have a lot. Uh, but the thing is, is what kind of writings sur survived from the period of time prior to the ending of the persecution? Generally, 
they were the writings of the, the, the fathers that we refer to now as the apologists. And these are public defenses of the Christian faith, generally with, uh, with a pagan audience at least partially in mind. And, uh, and on the other hand, there was a secret uh, tradition in the church. And sometimes people Protestants say, oh, you mean like the Gnostics? No, because the Gnostics had secrets that they withheld from other Gnostics. Uh, but the church didn't talk about everything that they taught in public. And uh, St. Basil talks about this in his treatise on the Holy Spirit. You also find evidence of this if you read St. Cyril of Jerusalem's catechism. Because one of the first things that he says to the uh, people who are being catechized is don't write down what I'm about to say. Now, obviously, someone didn't obey what he said because he <laughs> we have that. <laughs> what he said. But why would he say that? Well, he, this was after the persecutions had ended. But obviously, him telling people don't write this down, it was a reflection of how of a continuing practice that that originated from a time when the church was being persecuted. That's why even to this day, we sing the hymn of thy mystical supper. And then we say, neither like Judas will I, give, I will not speak of thy mysteries to thine enemies is, is the line that I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was a big deal in the early church not to speak of the inner teachings of the church. And St. Basil, interesting. it's interesting because the way we understand dogma now is almost the opposite of the way that St. Basil understood the term because basically he said there's dogma and there's kerygma. Kerygma is the public proclamation of the church. That's for everybody to hear. But the dogmas of the church are just for the church. And uh, and when he talks about the dogmas of the, uh, dogmas of the church, he talks about things like praying facing to the east, making the sign of the cross, baptizing by a triple immersion. And he's responding to people because he's, he's arguing that the Holy Spirit is a person. And he appealed in his arguments to the fact that we sing a doxology, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And his argument is, why would, why, why would we say glory to the Father who's a person and glory to the Son who's a person, but glory to the Holy Spirit, which is an impersonal force? And uh, But the, his detractors retorted, well, but you don't find that in the in the Bible, do you? And, and so he basically makes this long argument about the fact, well, there's lots of things that we do in the church that are not spelled out in Scripture, but they're part of the of the secret tradition of the church that's passed on within the church. And uh, so he mentions these things. And he mentions these things not because they were controversial uh, in his time. He mentions them because he knew that even the heretics he was responding to would recognize that, well, yeah, they accept those things. So he was appealing to things that everybody agreed upon to try to make a case for them to accept something that they were trying to dispute. I think another thing people forget is we don't have a lot of sources, especially pre-Nicene. I think after Nicene, like you were saying, there's so many resources, prayers, prayers to saints, prayers to God, that it's really not up for dispute anymore. But before Nicaea, they go, oh, well, there's not a lot of prayers to saints. You know, there's a passing prayer to the three youths in uh, the commentary on Daniel by St. Apollotus. That's the early third century. So it's not right. that we don't even have it at all. Um, that It exists. But why isn't there more? Well, I have to ask this question. Why isn't there more prayers to God <laughs> in the in the early pre-Nicene sources? I, I actually did the number somewhere. Let me see if I can find it real quick. And it was before the 20th century, there was only five extant, four or five extant hymns that we were aware before of. The fourth century? And before the 20th century. They only knew four or five extant okay. hymns. Since the 20th century, because there's certain archaeological finds, we're now up to 50. 41 of those are the Odes of Solomon. So they're from one set of sources. We never found that. The number wouldn't be much different. So someone could have made the silly argument, well, then how do we know they prayed to God, you know, <laughs> like other than the fact we preserved that. We didn't have the excellent sources. Here's well, we don't have text of the liturgy that date back prior to uh, the Council of Nicaea. As a matter of fact, 
uh, most of the text of the liturgy that we have, actually the, the manuscripts date from quite a bit after that. But we do know that people were serving the liturgy. <laughs> and St. Cyril of Jerusalem even mentions to them uh, praying for the departed and, and, and asking for the prayers of the saints in his catechism. So we know the kinds of things that were in the liturgy but we don't actually have any manuscripts that give us the text of the liturgy that date from that time. Now, I have a question for you. Do you serve, you serve the liturgy just in English? Do you sometimes do Slavonic or what? We do a Slavonic liturgy about once every uh, a month on a Saturday. So, and, but when I, I say my prayer is the, the silent prayers in English, but I do the prayers out loud in Slavonic. How much do you have memorized? Of the Slavonic, uh, you know, very little, uh, but uh, of the English, a lot, but still not all of it. But now, in, like, in the times, people had better memories. You know, when, you, when you're when you in a society where most people weren't even literate, memorization skills were much more highly honed. And, uh, and so, like, even in the Turkish period, there were a lot of Greeks that were ordained as priests that were just barely literate, but they could memorize the prayers well enough to be able to say them, even if they couldn't read them very well. And to this day, we have Muslims, even children, that the entire Quran memorized. Right. Roughly the size of the New Testament. It's not strange. Right. It's right. extremely common. Um, but that being said, like in a regular Orthodox context, you have several prayers memorized, I'm sure. Um, right. You may have the evening prayers memorized, something like that. For me, I have the evening prayers memorized, but not the more. I have like half the morning prayers fully memorized. Otherwise, right. I need to see the first sentence only because I'm tired, more tired in the morning. But here, here's my point of that. If people understand, if you adjusted for like inflation and ancient money, a book was like ten thousand dollars. There's a price of a junky car, right? It's because they had to make paper by hand, and it was very expensive. So why would you be writing things, like you said, weren't of an apologetic purpose, it was for evangelism to convince pagans to prevent persecutions, or was something you didn't need written because it was memorized? Right. So that's one thing people don't think of. Another thing, here's a, a random Bible I have next to me, right? Here's my Orthodox study Bible. Pretty decent shape. You know, it's come apart a little bit because it's used, right? Now, chances are, being that this is made to be used, it's hard covered and everything. It's going to last a good while, right? Probably lasts after I'm dead, but the maybe the outsiders started getting messed up. Now, I just picked this off the dinner table. Here's the prayer book, <laughs> All right? Now, if we look at the shape of the prayer book, my question is to the audience. Use your common sense. What is more likely going to survive in the Egyptian desert under sand for 1,700 years? This, which was built for frequent use and for something professional, which the scriptures would have been in a early church or some sort of personal prayers, obviously the scriptures. And so if we're speaking archeologically, you have to be honest go, well, what sources are gonna survive history? More likely it's gonna be the apologetic sources, the scriptures, the sources we have more of. It would be odd actually, unless they prayed the saints in so much more than we do now. And they had so many more prayers than we do now. Um, which would be unlikely being that we've not been doing this 20 centuries and been adding 20 more centuries of saints, that if we had more of these other sources, it would go against what we basically know about how we treat these documents today and the price of these documents and the fact that prayers tend to be memorized, hymns tend to be memorized. It's To me, it's basic common sense with what's what we're seeing Common sense is not used with the scriptures. It's not used with historical evidence. It's not used with the early church evidence. It's not used with archaeology. It, to reject the orthodox doctrine means to reject the simplest explanation of everything. That's a good point because, you know, if you think about, say, Origen's uh, response to Celsus, uh, that's not something that the average person would have been reading every day. But if you had a liturgy book of some sort, if you were using it, you would be using it all the time. So you would wear it out. I mean, I actually, I could show you on my shelf, but I've got a stack of uh, liturgy and vigil uh, Slujebniks that are like in, in the Slujebnik burial ground on my shelf because I had to replace them They were because they were falling apart. I still keep them because if I'm traveling, I'll use them because if I lost them and travel, it wouldn't be such a great loss. 
Do but, any of them uh, have candle wax on them? Oh yeah, they've got. They, they get. I, I'm they get sure that's not good. Quickly. I'm sure that's not good for long term preservation either. They get worn out <laughs> very quickly, and so what? What? What has survived is is no uh, proof that something didn't exist. No, that, that's, that's for sure. sure. So let's talk a little bit about the extant Jewish practices. We we referred to that before. Now we know. All the early Christians, from all the documentary evidence that we know of, venerated the saints. Did the Jews do the same? They certainly did. And I know at least the Shia Muslims venerate the saints to this day. I've met Shia Muslims that even had like a pendant with the uh, Virgin Mary on it. And uh, they have a very high veneration of, of the people that they understand to be saints. And you have to ask, where did they get that from? You know, where did the Jews get that from? Is it coincidental that the Christians do the same thing? Uh, I, I think it's more likely that it comes from a common tradition. And and like you're referring to, we have Talmudic sources. We have Jewish sources that explicitly have prostrations to the saints at their grave sites, prayers to angels. It's, it's funny because I was reading an article from it's, like within a religious journal, and it's about history of Judaism, it has nothing really to do with Christianity. And to Jewish scholars, and you can see the same, by the way, in older sources like Jewish Encyclopedia, this is yesterday's news. Everyone knows about this. This is not funny. It's not weird. Every Jew expects this. There's still Jews that venerate saints today, though Judaism, particularly after the 1700s, has become much more diverse and I think quite a bit stranger. <laughs> than than it was beforehand, but that but that aside, it it shows that if we were you and I were an atheist and we we're just historians and some liberal faculty in the University of Texas and we're in the history department, it would not be very strange to us to say all these silly ancients venerated saints because they're silly, right? Maybe that's how we'd rationalize it, but the historical fact they didn't wouldn't be up for dispute. It's only Protestant polemics and apologists, apologetics, which would reject this practice. It's something that all scholarship recognizes. And I think as you pointed out, that so much of what's on the internet is just open source stuff from the late 1800s, that right. if you have any newer scholarship, like I got a couple books uh, on the wall, like uh, the Marian books, right? Dr. Stephen Schumacher, that if you just know like what the scholars are aware that's been out there from the last hundred years, that's not open source, it would be even less for the debate. The, just the amount of archeological evidence and uh, you know, the cross disciplinary uh, historical work. Otherwise, how would you know what the Jews believed unless you were also researching history of Judaism, which a Protestant scholar really wasn't doing a hundred or so years ago. So, to me, I, I'm kind of flabbergasted. Once you put the pieces together, you're kind of flabbergasted anyone could seriously take this approach. And it seems to me the last readout is Sola Scriptura, but with the massive inconsistency of trusting the scriptures of the people that venerate the saints and using their own documents against them and interpreting right. away the parts of those documents which are inconsistent with the Protestant tradition. We, and, you know, the Protestants love St. Augustine, and they'll quote fairly liberally from St. Augustine's Confessions. If you read St. Augustine's Confessions, he talks a lot about his mother and tells all kinds of stories related to her. And obviously, he had a great love and, and uh, veneration for her after her death, although in his life, he wasn't always as respectful of a child as he later came to be. But uh, when he went to Rome... Uh, uh, and basically ditched his mother because he wanted to go by himself. His mother finally found out and then came to follow him. He was, uh, he actually wound up uh, going to uh, M Milan. And, he, and so he was under the, uh, St. Uh, Ambrose was there. And he, he tells a story about how his mother, who had all her life had the practice of bringing food to the martyrias of the, of the, of the saints on their feast days, brought them to on a feast to one of the martyrs and was told that she couldn't do that. And when she asked why, she was told St. Ambrose says no. And she had such a, an honor for St. Ambrose that she 
immediately accepted his instruction. This is at least on a popular level the, where the, the phrase when in Rome, do as the Romans do is supposed to have come from uh, because this was a North African custom, but it wasn't the custom in, in Italy, at least not in Milan. And she accepted it. But the fact is they had feast days of martyrs and she was going to celebrate them the way that she had done so all of her life. That, that's what St. Augustine is telling you in that story. And the only question was, how do you go about it? Not whether you do it. Um, and and the way she went about it was probably shocking to their their sensibilities because there's alcohol involved. And right. Like, why don't you Why don't you take the money you would spend on pretty much partying with the martyrs and uh, give alms? And so that kind of makes me think, though, that like we have the issue uh, in venerating the saints of Koliva. So. We already know that even saints could be, their sensibilities could be shocked and they could differ based just upon how you practice it. Right. So let's say there's a Protestant here and you go, Father John, you make all sorts of sense. And he, he comes, he goes to service for the first time on Sunday. And we don't very much follow keeping things secret anymore. And we haven't for a long time. And so they have a commemoration for someone who died a year ago and, and they're, they're lighting all sorts of incense and there's Koliva. Um, for this person, how is he to understand this? Because he's going to think from the Protestant context, are they worshiping their own dead? Or if it's a certain saint's feast day, are they worshiping that saint? And we're not going to talk about the Koliva. And so how would you maybe explain to a Protestant who's never seen that before how they should understand it? Well, the origin of it is, of course, related to the story of St. Theodore the Great Martyr and has to do with... Uh, Saint Edward or the Emperor Julian the Apostate, who had a plot to basically shame the Christians by sprinkling blood sacrifice to idols, of animal sacrifice to idols on all of the food that was being sold in the market. And uh, Saint Theodore appeared in a vision to the local bishop and told him to tell all the people to boil wheat and to eat that and basically described a food that the great martyr Theodore would have known and loved as you know, all of his life in the area he came from. And so that's the origin of that practice. So on St. Theodore Saturday, we, we bless Koliva. And then and that the Saturdays of Great Lent are also Saturdays commemorated to the memory of the departed. And so it became a custom to bless Koliva in conjunction with the memorials of the departed. And uh, so it's a it's something that we do in honor of the departed and also of the saints. And uh, we share a meal a after a, a, a commemoration. Well, any Protestant who's grown up in church knows that it's not uncommon for Protestants to have a meal in conjunction with their worship services. I mean, that's, you know, having barbecue or, or fried chicken on Sunday afternoon is a longstanding custom. Uh, in, in a lot of Southern Baptist churches for a reason. You got to eat, and this is a way of, of having a meal, but also honoring the saints and honoring the departed. And it, you're doing it in their memory. And the same reason we put flowers and pictures of people right. and things to that effect. And so, Father, let me give you um, any closing time for some closing comments you may have, and maybe we'll answer a few questions. Well, it's just, I, as a, when I was a Protestant, this was one of my five hangups that I had that I had to resolve. But once I looked at the evidence, it became very clear to me that this was always been what the church has done. And when you actually discover uh, what it means to be connected with the spirits of just men made perfect, as St. Paul talks about in the Epistle of the Hebrews, you discover that this is a great blessing that we have, the fact that we have a fellowship with the saints that have gone before us and that we can ask for their prayers. And we know that they are not just watching uh, and without concern for us, but that they're actually praying for us. This is a blessing. It's a great encouragement. Now, Father, if I run off screen, it's because my son's walking inside. And he's about to make a bunch of noise, okay. but for now he's not inside. So I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice and let it go. Let me ask this question. My question would rather be how the church has information about some people being in heaven after the apostolic period. 
surely this is not part of the apostolic deposit of faith. So I think his question is, how could we know they're saints if that's not part of the apostolic deposit of faith? Well, I don't know that that it's, it's not part of the apostolic deposit of faith. I think you find it very clearly in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 uh, and, uh, and talking about the spirits are just made perfect and the great cloud of witnesses. And as I mentioned, St. Polycarp, was not just Joe Schmo. He was a disciple of the apostle John. He was made Bishop of Smyrna, which you read about in the book of Revelation uh, by the apostle John. And uh, so, the, the, you, like I said, you have to assume that St. John wasn't a very good teacher and he couldn't pass on the faith for even a single generation before it became completely corrupt if you, if you don't accept that the veneration of the saints is a thing. Now, we have this question, which is, why is it so important to force everyone to pray to the saints, being that you're anathematized if you don't do so, according to the Council of Nicaea II? Well, because if you deny the, the, the prayers of the saints, you're breaking the communion of the church. I mean, like I said, we're not just in communion with the people around us. We're in communion with the saints that have gone before, and we... we ask for their prayers in the services of the church as they did clearly in Jerusalem in the time of St. Cyril, because he talks about it in his catechism. And uh, the very earliest text of the liturgy that we do have all contain prayers for the saints. So if you had someone who said, well, I'm not going to do that, well, that's causing a division in the church. So it's not just a inconsequential uh, choice. Uh, for, for someone to say, well, I'm not going to go to the liturgy because they pray for the saints or they ask for the saints' prayers. And and all the people that object to praying the saints do so for a doctrinal reason, which would call right. into question their salvation or or God's existence. Right. So like right. we were talking about it earlier, to say that the saint can't answer prayer, well, then are we divinized in heaven or not? Are we saved or we're not? <laughs> right? Right. It's a basic tenet of the religion. And so... Very often, and I find this like the mariological stuff, Mariolo mariological stuff that I do, is that if people realize that their heterodox opinions require, if you have that opinion, requires you to doubt some very basic dogma about Jesus Christ or very basic dogma about how we're saved by grace through faith or something like that, that they realize, oh, they weren't just being arbitrary and picking out, you better pray to the saint because it'd be weird if you don't, and we're just going to be really harsh with you for being weird. I they they weren't petty. I right. think let me let me add this because people don't understand this because they don't read the history. I've got the acts of the Lateran Council over there. And a lot of the a lot of the controversies in the seventh century, and this was just at the cusp of before Islam, when Heraclius reunited the empire, looked like the sky was the limit, and then a sudden collapse because of Islam, was how do we get the band back together? And they were coming up with very specific wording, which became monotheltism, monoenergism, to try to get the, the Miaphysites and the Diaphysites, which are us, the Orthodox, together. And so they weren't looking to be purposely divisive. They were looking the opposite. In fact, they explicitly say so if you read what they wrote. They were talking about people being needlessly divisive. So if the church made a canon, which is a rule, they're imposing it by Byzantine law and everyone in the empire, it wasn't arbitrary. This was something considered extremely important. So on the iconoclast side, for example, because they also affirmed the veneration of saints and had canonical penalty if you didn't, but just take the issue of icons, why would there, was it so important to persecute people for just having pictures like, like above? And it's because they became utterly convinced that's why they were losing the wars against the Muslims, right? It was considered a dire right. military necessity, just like, to be perfectly honest, the idea of having a unified religion in the empire was seen as necessary to keep the people together in order to be a cogent empire. So there were secular concerns with this. So definitely not were they being arbitrary by saying you must venerate the saints. None of these canons were arbitrary. And if people read the sources, they read the nitty gritty, they would never say that. So I just wanted to point that out. And also that particular <laughs> anathema is almost identical to the anathema of the iconoclast council. They probably included it because they wanted to make it clear we're not disagreeing with them when they're right. <laughs> so so this yeah, wasn't yeah. even an issue that they were having with the iconoclast. 
the iconoclast. That's and very Africa common. For the same reason. Like the the Hanatikon, which was the kind of annulment of Chalcedon. It was a Miaphysite document. Um, the Hanatikon had a statement that said that Christ voluntarily suffered and died. And, you know, we all believe this. Now, the repudiation of Hanatikon and also the Storianizing, which would be Constantinople II, puts that the same exact wording from the Hanatikon in Canon three. Right, so they will quote what's correct in heretical documents, heretical councils, because they're trying to show that everything's wrong. Right, clearly, you know. And so, what you're mentioning there would have not been the first time. There's also an interesting part in Nicaea two in the sixth session, where they quote the Council of Hyra, the Iconoclast Council, um, in the affirmative because it teaches the eternal damnation of people and and rejects that they're the idea that people could be there's the damned will ever be saved. And so it says, yes, the council's correct in saying this. So this is very common as well as the continuity, because again, they're cut from the same cloth. They're just off on this or that issue. And they obviously failed to run that by David Bentley Hart first. Well, and this, I could get in so many directions in that father, but <laughs> you, you know, well, that all of a sudden, they will say, oh, well, that wasn't in a sentence of a council. You go, well, how about canon two of the Council of Trullo, right? We have a canon that rejects these people and their doctrine. And then they'll say, well, they were tricked. So the canon's an error because they didn't know the historical, right? So they keep changing the goalpost. It's not right. a very cogent way of thinking. Got a whole video on that, responding to Father Kimmel for people interested in the channel if you want more nitty gritty in that. Right. Um, so... Let's see if we got any more questions. And because I don't know, I'm not Mr. Tech here. I'm not, not everyone's Father John. Now, uh, someone said that Father John Whiteford is great because he's one of the few clergymen that speaks out against liberalism. I want to ask this question Why don't more people do it? Because more people aren't liberal, they don't have big YouTube channels, they don't have big congregations. All the liberal churches end up dying. Why is liberalism so popular? Well, you, you, but you're asking, though, why do more priests not vocally get on the Internet and talk about it? I mean, I, I suppose in some well, cases. Well, they, no, because they, they don't want people to annoy them. I already know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, in some cases, it may just be because maybe they're not super tech savvy. Maybe they feel like, well, some, you know, Father John and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other other priests or Father Josiah Trenum are already covering the bases for me, so I don't need to say anything. Uh, I wouldn't assume that it means anything bad. Maybe they're just so humble they figure, why does anyone want to hear what I have to say? You know that 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 could also be the case. So the I saints. know from talking to most priests, most priests that I know are not liberal. Uh, I, I won't I won't name names, but a priest of an unspecified jurisdiction. <laughs> Uh, was told by his bishop that he had to to use multiple spoons for communion, and and I was told that uh, his answer was I was a I was a cook in the navy and I'll go back to being one, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but you know, he did not get on the internet and say this. He said it directly to his bishop, and uh, so. Well, you might, if you only knew what this guy said online, you might say, well, he's not a very courageous priest. But as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that was a pretty courageous thing for him to say directly to his bishop, and I admire the guy. I, I also know a priest who um, was kicked out of his church for not wearing a mask. So right. some church, uh, and he refuses to talk publicly about it. And that, he's very vocal to me personally, but he doesn't want to get into it. So it's a lot of his character. But I think in general, here's my axe to grind. I think the problems of academia, academia trains liberalism. It trains, it, it trains innovation, right? No one, you, you teach seminary classes, right? The one out of Illinois. Yeah. The pastoral and, school. Right, right. Generally, in an academic setting, no one's thesis is, let me explain to you what other people have already explained before. 
right? No one wants that. They want novel. They want new. Well, the problem is novel, novel and new is innovative. Innovative means heresy, <laughs> right? Wow. You want the same old thing over and over. And so there's a tendency because I believe the overly academic white collar imposition onto the church that in order to be in the church in these positions of authority, you can't have respect unless you have XYZ diploma. And what you're feeding into is really, I think an anti-Christian system of education. And so the, the average person going to liturgy believes what they hear during the liturgy is literally true. They believe what the scripture says is literally true you know, they take it at face value. So the the priests that believe these things are literally true have really less opposition from their own, from the lady. They're the ones that have the books that are more popular. It's what more Christians believe. This is true Protestants and Orthodox. Right. So why is liberalism so popular? It's because we're purposely feeding the church with people that have to go through a system, even if they believe it's all not, you know, Bull, you know what? But they have to go through the system, and so you're going to get more of it because that's what the system produces. And I, I wish people thought about that more critically. It's good that there's Jordanville, even though say like St. Tecons, they try to do the education within a traditional monastic context, and that's absolutely necessary. Uh, but when we remove that or we demand these certain academic credentials, it will lead to liberalism. It's inevitable. Because that's what the system produces. Well, also, it's a it's simply a fact that you have people like George Soros who have decided that if they want to change society, that they need to also try to change religious groups. And so they fund liberals within various religious groups to try to uh, change those denominations. And it's not just orthodoxy. It's other re Christian groups that are experiencing this. But uh, I guarantee you that public orthodoxy is probably getting some money from some Soros funded foundation or another that's enabling them to do this kind of garbage. Whereas that wasn't the case, you know, 20 years ago. And so it may seem like liberalism is on the rise in our ranks. And to some extent it, it probably is as a result of this stuff, but I don't think it's organic. And, uh, there's much to be said about in order to be an accredited university. So the credits are transferable between other universities. You got to get into the system. It's like being a 501 C three and right. you have to compromise to get into the system. And so right. it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, especially, especially we almost cut out there, especially when you have universities that get federal grant money or their academics, have to get certain theses and the only way you get money to study the thesis is from right. having a politically correct thesis. The system's polluted. People have to wake up and see that. And I, I know full well, because I've, I've been through it myself. Yep. We have an episode sort of on that actually uh, in October or something. So we did, we did a episode on Marxism. Let right. me ask you this. question: How much emphasis was placed on the tradition of same veneration in old Testament Judaism and how similar was their understanding of sainthood to the Christian understanding? Well, I mean, it obviously wasn't, uh, you know, something that you encounter on every page of the Old Testament, but you do find it. But I think that you have to understand that prior to the resurrection of Christ, we're talking about people who would have been in the bosom of Abraham in Hades rather than in heaven uh, in the presence of God. And so you can understand why the veneration of the Old Testament saints would have been more muted than it is in the New Testament. But, uh, but, but Saint, you know, St. Paul contrasts the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in the passage where he talks about us coming to the spirits of just men made perfect for a reason. Because if that was true in the Old Testament, it wouldn't have been worth mentioning it being a feature of the New Testament. Now, I got a couple questions on Oriental Orthodoxy, so I'm going to put them both up because it kind of goes together. And one person asks, what do you think of Oriental Orthodox? And another who, he's Greek and goes to the university in Greece, um, he said, what is the Old Testament view about people dying for Christ but are heterodox? They are not necessarily dying for their error like the cops that were beheaded by ISIS. Thanks. Well... 
the the Oriental Orthodox are even though they've been separated from us longer than most other Christian groups, they're probably the closest to us, even after 1500 years of uh, separation of any of the Christian groups. And uh, so they're admirable people. They're very pious. And uh, I certainly don't uh, look down on them as individuals. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I can learn a lot from them about keeping the fast and that kind of thing. And if we're talking about like those uh, cops that were beheaded by ISIS, I certainly wouldn't say, well, they all went to hell because they were heretics. I think that they, if they were following the light as best as they understood it, they died for Christ. I can't imagine that Christ said, well, tough luck, Chuck. Uh, you didn't accept the fourth ecumenical council. So you go directly, directly to hell. Do not pass go do not collect $200. I, but you're talking about something that the church hasn't revealed to us. And so we can't say exactly how God looks at that, but they're in God's hands. And, uh, and so I, I, I wouldn't look down on people like that. You certainly don't hold them up as, vener as, as for veneration in the, within the church, because they obviously had an imperfect understanding of the faith and, and being held up for veneration is not just simply a matter of the fact that, a matter of the fact that you died for Christ was also that you stood for the true faith and the full sense. And you're to be held up as an example. And we don't want to hold up uh, people who are outside of the Orthodox church as examples to be emulated. But I don't think that that means that they're going to hell. I mean, I knew Nazarenes uh, there was a Nazarene who my mother read me about him when, he, when I was a kid and I met him right before he died. His name was Elmer Schmelzenbaugh. He was a, he was a, the son of the first missionary to Swaziland, Africa. And I met him right after he had had a stroke. And the guy, he had such a love for Christ that uh, I, I was moved just listening to the guy talk. And uh, obviously he had an imperfect understanding of the faith. But I'm not going to say the guy is roasting in hell right now. I kind of doubt that that's the case. I have, I have a feeling that Christ see you know saw that, that that he followed the light that he had been given and that he loved him and that he would be merciful but i can't make a dogmatic statement about that because now we're talking about things that are outside the normal means that the church has provided for salvation uh, but that doesn't mean that they can't be saved the thief on the cross wasn't baptized uh and uh, and yet he was with christ in paradise so i kind of think that elmer uh, might be given a special uh break by God for similar reasons. And uh, uh, now I'm not the, usually it's me with the baby in the background and now we got a baby on your side. Yeah, my granddaughter. <laughs> care, which is cute. The, I got uh, so much more done but, before she was born, but it's nice to, to have the distraction. No, it's, and to be perfectly honest, that's, uh, I'm just going to make this point and then we're, we're going to give our plugs and spend some quality time with the kids. But okay. I will, I will say this, the St. Augustine, I think it's an on baptism against the Donatist. He says, I'm going to paraphrase. You could have baptism. You could have sacraments. You could have the Eucharist. You could have martyrdom, but you can't have salvation outside the church. And so we want to be careful not to pit saints against each other or say a saint's wrong when they make a statement like this. What could we say? We could say normatively, heretics aren't saved, right? Normatively, those in the church are those that are saved. Right. Normatively, those outside the church are not saved. We could say all these things. What we can't pass judgment on are specific individuals. There's no canon right. saying, you know, Father John Whiteford's going to heaven or Father John Whiteford's going to hell. Now, we have, can we have canons that say specific people go to hell. So we could know that, but... We can't know that about guys beheaded by ISIS and things like that. And so I think it's important Saint Paul to. Says, Saint Paul says God will judge those outside of the church, and so that's where we leave it. But we know God is merciful, also. We 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 affirm the teaching, the scriptures, and the saints. And right. what we don't do is presume upon what they don't teach. Right. Uh, I will make this personal comment though. I found many Oriental Orthodox to be very highly receptive to Eastern Orthodoxy because their faith isn't drastically different. 
I find that a lot of their their disagreements ultimately, and I don't think it was true in the past, like the days of Severus, who was very well informed, and he was informed wrongly. But now a lot of them go to um, Eastern Orthodox seminaries and whatnot, and they're really not all that different in what they believe, but they don't like how we say it, which is like, well, it's good we have all this agreement, but it's not good that you're it's so disagreeable about because you don't like how we said it. Right. I also think that Oriental Orthodox tend to be most humble of the bunch. And it's probably just because there's so many more Arabs and they actually come from places where your faith actually costs you something. Right. And uh, so that's, that's something to be said as well. And uh, there's also quite a bit of ecumenism, which is, isn't good between Arabs and Arabs, because again, right. they're almost tired of all these problems. So there's a lot of good and where they're bad. It's because they're actually good natured. And so it's, uh, doesn't mean you could approve of the heresy, but I know very godly Oriental Orthodox people. And, uh, and I, I give thanks to God for anyone that gives his grace and shows his grace to others and experiences that grace. And so that's true of Protestants, Roman Catholics, yeah and Oriental Orthodox, uh, and of course, the Eastern Orthodox. So that, that's yeah. how I feel anyway. The um, So let, let people know what you're up to. We got your blog here on the thing scroll on the bottom, stjonah.org. What are you up to lately, Father? Well, I've got my blog going. Uh, I've got my grandbaby that distracts me throughout the day uh, <laughs> and keeps me from doing some stuff that I would like to be doing. But like I said, it's a joy. Uh, I'm uh, uh, hoping to be blogging more. I've been, uh, if you look at my blog in the last year, I've been spending a lot of time posting reader services for people who have been under lockdowns. And I promised that I would keep it up as long as there were uh, English speaking people who were still under lockdowns. And so I'm still having to focus on doing that to some extent with my spare time. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully I'll have a little bit more free time to work on a few other projects that I would like to. It's yeah. I think you got some real good, uh, projects in the pipeline that, uh, would be the way things are going to be even more necessary than ever. And, uh, I'll I'll just my phone that will make it easier for me to start working on my next project, which is to have a, a podcast about how to do the services, reader services and otherwise. Well, you said it, not me. So I, I yeah. look forward to that. I will plug it hard when it's out. And uh, I look, f I really look forward to that, especially. Yeah. Yeah. I hope there's some singing involved because I'm terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, my plug is scroll on the bottom, orthodoxchristiantheology.com. Of course, I always have orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate for supporting the church in Cambodia. So if this has blessed you, please do that. And please uh, follow Father John. And uh, and his blog and support him wherever wherever he goes and does his thing. Yeah. Uh, well, Father, it's a great like I said. I, I'm greatly honored that you come on. You've supported me since the beginning, and you've been very helpful tonight in unpacking these issues. So let me extend my thanks and the thanks to the audience for coming on this evening. Well, thank you. Well, I'll end this show as I end all the shows by quoting Jesus to Rock, saying, Fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a good night.